Hello, and welcome to another special nanosode brought to you by Backroom Whispering Productions in conjunction with The Book Table. Today, you are back with myself, Medlen, and Rebecca. And we will be discussing a kind of wrap-up, I suppose, of our NaNoWriMo 2015 experience. Yay. Specifically, we're definitely going to be talking about winning, but also winning early. Because we both managed to win pretty early, which was really exciting. So we're going to talk about sort of what kept us motivated and how we cranked all of them words out. It's incredibly exciting. I mean, I don't know how many NaNoWriMo's you've done. This is my third. And in the past two NaNoWriMo's, I did not win before the end of the month. And uh, if you were to go look back at my stats, especially for 2014, they get really ugly in the middle of the month. Like there was clearly a period where I was doing almost no writing. And then I had to make a mad dash sprint towards the end. And mostly what I did last year was break a rule that I set for myself, which is whenever I write, I keep word count based on the master manuscript, which is basically all the stuff that's being written in order and then I'll often have little side parts or ideas that come to me that I'm just I'm ready to write but they're not chronologically in the story yet so I'll put them aside and I don't count them towards word count but last year I broke that rule and just like threw them all into the master document <laughs> to make the word count which is why if you were to look at my stats they like really are total shit and then at the end in the last like two days it suddenly spikes upward and I'm like, that's because I cheated with myself, but technically didn't cheat. It just, I cheated with myself. It was such a bad story last year, though. Like, I trashed that whole document and, like, deleted it. Like, I put it in the trash and emptied my trash. It was really bad. Like, I lost complete. No. Any love I had for it, I, I killed because I didn't like where it was going. <laughs> yeah, that's so crazy. I have, I, okay, so this was my fifth year and my fourth win, I mm. believe. Um, and my first win was, uh, I think I probably finished around on time, certainly not particularly early, um, and it was like a vampire romance story. Oh my. So it was super dialogue heavy, which was kind of annoying because as I was writing through it, my page count was getting huge, but my word count wasn't going up that much, and <laughs> so that was frustrating. Um, and then the next year, I did like this really weird thing. I wrote an experimental fiction that was a stream of consciousness, first person, like you never learn the name or the gender of the narrator, and it was... Um, about teen suicide, basically. Wow. I wrote dark stuff. I'm sorry. That's why we're um, the monarchs of darkness. We're called yeah, that for a reason. The monarchs of darkness. It's true. Mm -hmm. Um, but so that was actually really fun to write. But I think I literally like it was also pretty difficult to write because there was almost no dialogue. It was like all exposition, and it was really heavy, like kind of depressing stuff. So I'm pretty sure that every time I got to like the word count that year, like I would get to like what a sixteen hundred. Mm -hmm. for the day or whatever I was just like okay I'm done for today um, <laughs> and that one is actually one of the only ones that I considered pretty much complete after Nano Remo. I think wow. it, I ended up completing it at about 65,000 so it's really a novella versus a novel um, sure and then the next year was the first year where I had this account I do not know my old account information which is depressing to me but that's when I got an account with my now fiance because we were going to write a book together and I think we got a total of 1400 words in that book during that nano remo because it's really kind of frustrating to try to figure out how to do that when you're co-writing something i'm sure that some people are really good at it i was not i was like what do you want me to be writing what should i be writing i can't write anything because i don't know what he's going to be writing what's going on <laughs> so that died like really quickly and then uh, last year i think i actually kind of cheated because that was when i was writing the necromancer's daughter which i did eventually finish like three months later and uh, that was around 110k but I'm pretty sure that I didn't quite write 50k in October or in November, but I had started it a couple months before, so I ended up just putting the whole book count in at the end because I was like, you know what, I'm gonna win this year. 
so that was terrible cheating. That was horrible cheating. Well, I guess you could say we've both cheated at some point in our ways. This year, we did not cheat. Oh, hell no, Uh, we didn't. This year, I did not start it and not write a single thing in my story until November 1st, and I finished it. Well, I didn't finish it. I'm still writing it. But I got to 50K on November 17th. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Which was two days before I reached at least 50k on the 19th. And then I know because you'd challenged me to write 65,000 by the end of the month, by the time I'd reached 50k. But obviously, I got um, injured, my own damn fault. Um, But I was injured and on pain medication. And if I wasn't on pain medication, I was in pain. So that made it very difficult for me. Pain medication is not. (laughs) (laughs) I I didn't see me writing on pain medication or while in pain as a very good idea, especially when I'm writing characters who are all and very careful in the words that they choose to say. So um, <laughs> that was a problem. So I did at least make it to 61,000 because I somehow on the 30th cranked out like 4,000 words and I still don't quite know how that happened. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. I've never finished this fast and I've never been so consistently ahead of the word count. Like the yeah. target this like like this even I mean I looked back at my past two years and like the first year when I won I was pretty much steadily on target the whole time that book never did get finished like I still have that massive part of a manuscript sitting in my computer and maybe one day I'll go back to it but the second year obviously was a total was an ugly hot mess but this year it was like I kind of hit the ground running and tried to stay so far ahead. But I know I tried to stay ahead because I knew there were going to be maybe like days I would potentially travel or also um, the holiday. I mean, I think a lot of people try and cram more words in before the holiday because nobody really wants to write on Thanksgiving or Black Friday or anything else like that. In the US at least. I gotta say, in terms of inspiration, I found it really helped that this year I had you as basically my nano buddy. I'd never really had a serious nano buddy before. I I kind of did in 2013, but we weren't as close in terms of nano buddies as I think I was with you. I mean, like I was sending you snippets of stuff I was writing and I pretty much detailed all of my story out to you. It was like, yeah. so these are the people, this is how it ends. Uh, the middle stuff is still kind of in flux, but it's getting there. Whereas in like 2013, when I had a quote unquote nano buddy, I mean, I kind of knew what she was writing. She sort of knew what I was writing, but we weren't sharing portions of our manuscripts with each other or anything like that. Mainly because I don't think I trusted her enough to be able to (laughs) give it to her. (laughs) And if she'd given me hers, it would have been rough because she was writing a kind of paranormal romance that I would not have enjoyed. (laughs) It would not have been my bag. It would have been awkward. I would have been like, I'm sure it's good, but I am not your target audience. Uh, Please don't send me anymore. I don't. I was like, I really don't. I really don't. But to her credit, I think she actually finished her novel, whereas I still have not yet finished a novel, though I am working to finish this year's NaNoWriMo, like actually just finish the book, because I'm still writing it. So I figure that's a good sign. Yes. (laughs) If I can get to a certain point, the ending is basically done. (laughs) And I think, like, for me, I think that was super key, and I, I just, if other people who have struggled with NaNo in the past could try to figure out how to do what we did, like, we were the two weeks leading up to NaNoWriMo we were emailing back and forth every day like here are my story ideas and here are my characters and do you like this do you like this or I think I changed my mind about this and sort of world building together which was really helpful because then obviously by the time we both started we had more grounding and we had talked through things Mm -hmm. in terms of our story and then we were also emailing back and forth every day checking up like hey how are you doing what's going on in your story today what's new in blood and steel or tell me more about what's happening in DSR. How many words did you get? What's your writing schedule for today? Like we were super motivating each other in the best possible way. It wasn't like you have to write 3000 words today. It was just that uh, like our genuine interest, I think our genuine interest in each other's stories and the sharing that we were doing um, constantly back and forth was just super motivational. I know it was for me because it felt like, yeah, like someone else cares about what I'm doing other than me. And it got me jazzed to be writing my story every day. So that was huge. I think that's really the same for me. Like I said, I've never really had someone who every day would just be like, so what's happening in the story and would sit there and basically tolerate all of my super anxieties about when I'm like, I don't think the plot's going anywhere. I'm just sitting here in exposition. And I'm really worried. This Everything is, not- is plot. 
everything is plot. That became our mantra because, well, especially with me, just because I think most of my writing has been done in the world of film and video. And in that case, you're always trying to find ways of doing exposition that don't involve you sitting there explaining it to your audience. Like you, cause you have visual and audio cues that you can do to like explain world building. Whereas in a book, you have to literally detail out everything. And then there's the question of like, how do you do it in a way that doesn't just stop or kind of info dump? at people, which is always my biggest like, oh God, I think I'm just info dumping. Of course, it doesn't help that I write a protagonist whose mind literally runs in circles. Like all he does is run his mind in a circle on the same 10 oh, freaking he's thoughts. The best, though. <laughs> I love him. Oh, well, he's it. And I at least created my, my adorable little precious cinnamon bun. The too, cinnamon bun. Too sweet for this world. Okay, so for the listeners who are now perfectly confused as to what I'm talking about, um. <laughs> I created a small child character in the story who I'd kind of meant to sort of be in only one scene. He was part of a, a snippet or like a scrap that I'd written to come in later. And so I figured he was a only- cinnamon bun! Cinnamon bun! And he was only going to be in that one scene, but I was like, you know, I think I can introduce him earlier. And he was so precious that literally right now I, I have to fight the urge to just try and include him in tons of scenes because I'm like, no, logically he would not be in this scene. But cinnamon bun. There's also the fact that he's likely one of the only people who will live at the end of this story. Yes! Cinnamon bun is safe. Cinnamon <laughs> bun will live. He will live. Oh my gosh. That's like, do you know the, uh, the nostalgia critic? Yes. Uh, have you seen his review of Independence Day? No. Okay. You should go watch it. Cause he always jokes about the dog Boomer and he's like, Boomer will live. <laughs> so that's how I feel with <laughs> the cinnamon bun will live. For anyone who's mildly used, we're both writing like basically mass destruction at the end. And by the way, we did not come up with together. These were independents that we both just happened to. Yeah. Um, but there's uh, just a lot of a lot of murder at the end of both of our books, and so we've had conversations about like, oh, today I was writing a list of like the people that will actually survive to the end of my story. I'm not evil. What? Um, Between that so, and constantly being like, I think we were both discussing how, oh uh, yeah, I'm just I gotta get through this so I can get to this torch scene which I'm so excited for and I'm like oh our brains are fine what are we talking yeah, about no, we're, not, we're not terrible what are you <laughs> we're absolutely about? perfectly normal human beings what are you talking about nothing's wrong okay, with me but, but really in, in real life I'm fuzzy except maybe a spider hates spiders oh man but who doesn't hate spiders but anyway the point is when uh, Matt told me that cinnamon bun was safe I was very relieved because I was quite concerned yeah <laughs> Cinnamon Bun was introduced in the story where, like, basically no one survives. And I was like, you can't kill Cinnamon Bun. I know. I, I did decide he would live. He and, like... Because the thing is, is that the only two characters I definitely know are, you know, dead. D-E-D, -E -D, dead. At the end of the story. I mean, I plan... I don't plan many things, but that's one where I went, no, there is no way these two characters are surviving this story. Everybody else is just kind of left up in the air just because of the way my finale will work because I stuck very strictly in one character's perspective. Um, it's like third person, person omniscient, but it's just that one character's perspective, or I guess that's third person limited. Whatever yeah. the case, because I was sticking with one character, you don't really know if anybody else is alive who's been involved in the story at the end of it. And oh, yeah. so I'm like, they could be dead. They could be alive. There are at least two characters I, in my head, refuse to believe are dead. One being Cinnamon Bun. Cinnamon Bun will live no matter what. Cinnamon Bun will live. No matter what. And I'm pretty certain my Praetoria Maxima, who, if you were to loosely translate, it's something like a captain of the guard. Pelias, who's a character I've started to basically fall in love with. I'm like, you're gonna have to live. I can't. I can't. You're the one decent human being in this story. I can't kill you. <laughs> so those are the only two who in my mind are definitely in my head alive at the end of this story, but you never really know because you don't see them. I know. You I know. Will know. You will know that Cinnamon Bun lives. Whereas at the end of your story, literally almost everyone is dead, right? I yeah, mean- Yeah, well the thing is that I also have a much bigger cast than you. This is true, mine is significantly smaller. <laughs> but to be fair, a lot of the people, so mine takes place on a pirate ship. If nobody has listened to our first nanosode, mine is like a dark pirate fantasy. And it's a pretty big ship. So there are approximately like 80-ish able-bodied sailors. And then I think it's like 13 officers, plus the seven women and the three high 
hostages. So there's a like there's a lot of people. There's that is that that's like a hundred almost exactly. And I didn't do that on purpose either. But anyway, it's a lot of people. And I think like the total that is going to be alive at the end that I can think of in my head right now is six, maybe seven. So uh, significantly more than half of the named characters that you meet will be dead, and then everybody else. It's a lot of murder. So it's a lot, and it is murder. <laughs> um, <laughs> So <laughs> it's not just like, oh, the shipwrecks in the middle of the sea and these are the lucky survivors. No, no, there's some wrath and anger and things going on there. And a lot of the characters that are going to die towards the end, especially some of the main characters, are going to definitely super die on screen. Oh, and dear. it's going to be a pretty brutal but hopefully satisfying because... I'm going to leave it there. No, that's good. And didn't you say you think you've basically got a trilogy on your hands too, right? Yeah, that was a mistake. So I was originally writing this as sort of like a just a standalone mm -hmm. because I don't often I write standalones and sometimes they become duets. Sure. Um, but I don't like to just like come up with a trilogy at the beginning because I'm always like, but what is the point of the second book? Ugh. Which is not to say I have not read great trilogies, but usually my idea is if there's more than one like huge plot thing, it's just two. But this one, yeah, I, as I told Matt in one of our email correspondences, um, it just kind of exploded on me because where they end at the end is just like they're at this place called the Freelands, which nobody knows what it is. It's like a different realm. And I was just going to end the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and just say hey these people survived they're in this land that they think is endless possibilities so maybe they're happy but I got really interested in the freelands first of all so I thought maybe I'll write a second book that like explores the freelands and establishes the fates of the main characters who survive um <laughs> But the thing is that then when I was writing this, I ended up getting really involved in the political world of the world that they leave from to get to the Freelands. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of stuff there that was left unresolved because it had to be just like based on the trajectory of the story. And I was like, you know what? I can see them coming back and like dealing with this and this being another story. And part of it is this all revolves around a knife that theoretically can kill divine beings. And like supposedly there's a god that's trying to kill the Ephraim, which are the spirit that guide this world and so one of our characters is trying to stop the god from doing this but then eventually decides that he has to kill all of the gods so that the Ephraim will always be safe because they can't destroy the knife the knife is always going to be so there's like a whole like divine arc going on there but then there's also all the very real political stuff that was happening in the world because some of the characters are like important people in the world so yeah I just was like oh wow so this is like you know we got our book getting to the freelands we're gonna have a book in the freelands that I can see and I know I can envision what will happen and why it will be important and then at the end of that one getting back to the real world and then what happens there so yeah it became a trilogy which was kind of exciting but also like no why <laughs> <laughs> i guess it's lucky from like kind of like you at the outset i don't think i could ever plan something to be like a trilogy or even a duology i think i have a tendency to just want to tell one story and close it all the way and just be happy i mean though granted at the end of my story which is very much an open shut story there's no way it would be a sequel yeah everybody's dead pretty much <laughs> And to those who are alive, I mean, it could be like, oh, well, maybe if I ever wanted to go back and write, I could do Cinnamon Bun, but I honestly have no story that I want to tell with him because I, the, the goal, this is one of the few times I started out telling a story where the goal was actually to get to a certain end point and be like, there's like, I just wanted this image at the end. That was the point of my story. Um, yeah. And so when my characters are dead, I mean, it's like, well, I have nothing else to tell in this world unless, you know, maybe later. I mean, I would maybe hold on to the magic system for later because I loved creating that. That was one of my favorite parts of the weird research planning process. I, I, I don't think I could ever write a trilogy. I mean, arguably, though, the only one I could consider would be the Nano I started in 2013. It was going to end up being a hella long book. And it had a very much a three-act structure where I went, yeah, I could maybe turn that into a trilogy if I felt like it, but it'll never happen. But I think that's pretty cool that, like, you know, you started running with an idea and then said, oh, but, you know, maybe I should think about this, too. Because it's good to know what's happening in your story, even if it's never mentioned, you know? And mm -hmm. you ended up settling upon... <laughs> this whole three-part story. I think it's pretty wild because, I mean, it's like you said, so many people, I think, end up writing trilogies because trilogies are kind of like the hot thing and the second book is usually pointless. 
And even though there are plenty of phenomenal trilogies where the second book is very good, or in the case of films, it could be like the original Star Wars trilogy where Empire was arguably the best one. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to like poo-poo trilogies because I'm even like sitting here looking at some awesome trilogies that are on my bookshelf in front of me. I am too. <laughs> uh, you know, and so trilogies can be amazing. Mm -hmm. and, but I think that you, uh, that's a pretty universal complaint that people will make is that in trilogies like, ugh, but the second story is so boring because usually in trilogies, at least in like modern YA trilogies, especially there's sort of like one overarching plot that mm -hmm. just has two sort of stopping points and yeah. often I think there's more oomph given to the stopping point in the first book because you have to as a new writer be writing a standalone with serious potential versus this is the first in a trilogy type of thing yeah unless you somehow magically sell the trilogy up front and like that's yeah. it I mean I think um like the one of the best trilogies I'm reading right now which is not yet finished it will be in February I can't even handle um is uh the Red Rising trilogy by Pierce Brown and he sold the whole trilogy up front just based on the first book and that book ends but you're like oh no there's so much left to do where I and then when you read the second book Golden Sun, which just won the Goodreads Choice World Award for Best Science Fiction. Uh, I was quite pleased. Um, oh, it's, yeah. It's literally kind of like when you watched A New Hope and then you went into Empire and your mind got blown. That was what happened in Golden Sun and it also left off on a cliffhanger that left me literally just screaming profanities at my Kindle. And it, <laughs> it was, I, I, I do not get very vocal when I read. I'm pretty much a silent reader. I literally lost my mind when I finished that book. I was like, excuse me, excuse me. You do not get to do this to me. Yeah, no, I think it's just because so many things end up being trilogies because, you know, they just do that. It's really easy to kind of write them off and say, oh, but like the second. I just still think it's crazy that you ended up writing a trilogy. I'm like, shit, I'm writing one book. I'm writing a book, singular. And I'm like, all right, do the thing. Yes, well, you will do the thing and eventually you will be at the point where I am, where you have done the thing enough times that you can come up with bigger ideas and be confident in finishing them. Which... But the other thing is that standalone novels, like closed stories, are a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Like, it is so nice. While it is kind of nice to know that you're reading a book in a series and you're going to get more of the characters and more of the world and whatever, it's also really nice to read a book and know that from beginning to end, it's all just like right there in front of you. And it's just going to be like this story. I, I, I love that, which, you know, it, that makes me think of when I read Ember in the Ashes and I was under the impression it was going to be a standalone. And I was so PO'd at the ending. Absolutely not a standalone. Oh my but, God. No. Hey, you all can listen to our, the book table episode on Ember in the Ashes to hear us talk more about that. Yeah, and by talk we mean Medlin did a lot of griping, whereas other people were far more kind to it. Let's see, in terms of we've technically won Nano, but we both, neither of us had finished our novels yet. We're both still writing. Right. You've got a target for when you want to have the first draft done. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to try to get it finished before the holidays. That's what I'm talking about. Dang, that's incredible because you're already at, how many words are you at already? I'm at uh, 76K and I think that it's going to end up being, the thing is I'm like not as far in my story as I thought I would be at 76K. Mm -hmm. So I have this problem um, where sometimes I'll like realize, oh, I'm getting close to 100K so I should end it soon because a standard novel ends up, or is like up to 120k mm -hmm. um and so then i'll just like rush through stuff at the end I'm like hey we got to the end yay everything's done now so i'm gonna try not to do that that was a complaint um by some of my beta readers of the necromancer's daughter so i had to go in and fill some stuff out and it might still feel a little rushed who knows but um but that was kind of where i was with that as i got to 100k and i was like oh hey i can just gonna just okay and then this happened and this happened and this happened the end. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> That's awesome. Well, that's pretty cool. I mean, because for me, it was like you asked me, I was like, I really don't have a target day I want it done by. I mean, I guess I could try and shoot for like either end of this year or end of January, which is probably going to be more likely just because I'm a slower writer than you are. Not a lot slower, though. Let's be real. You were keeping up with me for a long time there. For a little bit, I was. Um, and right now I'm probably sitting somewhere near 65,000. I haven't inputted the latest stuff 
that I wrote into like a counter. Um, so my my process is I, I write in Google Docs, um, but I separate everything out by chapter um, where I just think a natural chapter end is. So I have some chapters that are like pretty short versus others that are kind of long. And then later I just have a massive Word doc that I plug everything into so I can just see the word count. And last I checked it yesterday, I was just under 64,000. I think I wrote at least a thousand words today and I'll probably write a little more. So I'm probably somewhere sitting around 65,000, but I don't really have a target word count for where I want it to end. It'll just be, this is where the story ends and therefore it ends. So I yeah. think my goal is just really to r try and write every single day and make progress. I mean, just write. And if I hit a wall, it's like, got to work through why that wall is there. I'm usually one of those people who will ignore trouble scenes and like, you know, put something in bolded in red and say, go back to this later. But I've sort of realized from two, well, now three NaNoWriMo's that if I ignore problem scenes, I'll never get back to them. And it'll actually bother me because working through the problem scenes usually introduces something that could affect later stuff in the manuscript if I just skipped it. Right. So I've just found that this year it's best for me to literally just keep plowing through in um, novel like chronological order and just keep going. So goal is to every day write to hopefully get between, uh, you know, like at least close to 2000 a day, if not, you know, at least over 1000. If I get under 1000, I better be like, okay, why is the word count low? Like what happened? What's mm -hmm. the reasoning? Was it work? Was it life? Was it like something wasn't working in the story? You know, whatever excuse I dream up for myself. And then I will yell at you the next day. I'm just kidding. I never yell. That's true. You're always just like, that's okay, but you got to keep writing. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. I'm usually yelling at myself so you don't have to yell at me. <laughs> I'm just like, do the thing. I know, which is so helpful. And I think it's because I know that I'm immediately going to send you the manuscript when it's done and just be like, please ignore, actually, please fix all typos and anything else that's nonsense in here. I don't even know anymore because I'm at that phase where it's like my baby and I still want to really take care of it. And I know the moment I finish, I'm going to fling it off to you and like maybe one other person and just be like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it for like a I'm month. I'm done now. I, don't, I can't see it. I can't see it for a long time. It happens. That is what happens. Yeah, okay. it's sort of like, I, I can't look at it. I don't even want to hear about it. I don't want to hear anything about it until you guys have read it all the way through and, and fixed all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, it's still a need. This is my precious baby, and I can't show it to anybody. Face. Especially when, like, my family knows that I do NaNoWriMo. My mom's pretty much the only one who remembers out of my family. But when they're, they're like, oh, so what's it about? How's it going? Like, and, and I'm like, I understand you're trying to be really helpful, but I really don't want to talk about it yet. C can I just, you know, say that it's a thing. I'm doing a thing. When the thing is done, maybe you can see the thing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe. If you're lucky. Of course, the thing is that I also know that what I write, I'm like, I don't think any of my family would want to read this because nobody in my family really reads fantasy. Yep. I guess the the ending, the summation of all of this is just do the thing. Yes, everybody, do the thing. And you also will hopefully be hearing from some other members of Backroom Whispering Productions who participated in NaNoWriMo particularly a couple people who didn't finish um, so that we can talk about different strategies and essentially what stopped them up and blah, blah, blah. Um, so look forward to that coming soon. We got a couple more nanosodes and then we're going to try to continue to do some mini-sodes is what we're going to call them when we just get people together to talk a little bit about writing. Since the book table, we talk about reading and what we're reading. We figured it would be fun to have just little companion episodes about those of us who do writing. Um, so from the other side, essentially. Yeah, just so you can make sure you get all aspects of the creative process. I would say yeah. that is it. So we are going to sign off and we hope that you will come back and listen to us chat some more. Yay! Thanks for listening. The Book Table is a podcast from Backroom Whispering Productions. Our theme music is by Mark Wayne. If you like this podcast, rate us on iTunes. Or get in touch with us on Twitter at Backroom Whisper, on Facebook at facebook.com slash backroomwhispering, or by email backroomwhispering at gmail.com. See you next time! Thank you.